O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, we are on our third sermon in our Growing Disciples for Life sermon series, and today we're focusing on chapter two of our booklet, uh, which is titled, I Am a Disciple. And so today uh, I want to focus uh, briefly on just the purpose of this chapter. The purpose of this chapter is that you would know what a disciple is, that you would point the finger at yourself and say, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. And then third, that we would move as a congregation from a membership mindset to a discipleship mindset. And we'll talk more about what that means uh, here shortly. Uh, really today I want to focus in, though, on the, the question of what are some of the challenges and some of the opportunities if we are to embrace a discipleship mindset rather than a membership mindset. And so we're on page 29 in our booklets. Uh, we have copies of those booklets in the narthex if you still need one. I encourage you to read chapter 2 if, if you haven't read chapter 2, and then read chapter 3, which we'll look forward to next Sunday's sermon. So, very simply stated, a disciple is one who has come under the good and gentle authority of Jesus. We, we see this in the, the Great Commission itself, that this is what it means to be a disciple. Uh, discipleship always begins with the authority of Jesus. Jesus, crucified, risen from the dead, stands before his disciples before he ascends into heaven, and he says, all authority belongs to me. That is basically Jesus saying, I'm in charge of everything. Or as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is in charge. Now, the logic of Jesus being in charge is that everybody comes under his authority. And so this is the call of discipleship. The disciples would go and make disciples who are baptized into the authority of Jesus and who learn to live under the authority of Jesus. Now, sometimes we might push back a little bit on that word authority, right? Because we can look around in the world and we can see countless examples of authority abused or misused. But what I want you to see about Jesus' authority is that his authority is for your benefit. His authority is an authority that kneels down and washes the disciples' feet just hours before he's betrayed and arrested. Uh, the authority of Jesus is an authority that lays down its life for you, even to the point of dying on a cross, so that you might belong to God forever. Do you see the difference? That there are a lot of authorities in this world that will use their authority for their own interest or the interest of an organization or, or something like that. But, but here we have the, the, the authority of Jesus being used for the benefit, the good, the blessing of those under that authority. And so to be baptized into the authority of Jesus means that you have a break with your past, that you're no longer in the kingdom of darkness, you're in the kingdom of light. It, it means that your sins are forgiven. It means that your, your present is under the authority of Jesus. Your future is under the authority of Jesus. That also means that we are continually taught, well, how do I live then as somebody under the authority of Jesus? This authority does not uh, have just some of us, but all of authority really means all of me. It means that there is no secret corner of our lives as disciples that doesn't belong to Jesus. It means that everything is coming under his good and gentle authority. So, and so I like to talk about this in terms of head-heart habits. By head, I mean what I think and believe is true. So it would be inconsistent with being a disciple if we would say, the words of Jesus say this, but I think and believe this, right? It means that our head comes under the authority of Jesus so that we have the mind of Christ. By heart, we mean that our affections and our desires come under the authority of Jesus. It means that our heart has been captured by the grace of God, that, that we've had a, a crisis We've had an understanding of our own sin and brokenness, and that's led us to put our trust in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation, and that's changed our hearts. 
And then finally, by habits, we mean that, that, that the love of Jesus Christ in my life, his authority, makes a difference in how I spend my time, my days, my weeks, my months, my years, right? Now, sometimes, once again, we might struggle with this word authority because we as sinners, it's in our nature to say, I don't want anybody to have authority over me except me. The truth, though, is that anything that has authority over you that is not Jesus will eventually hurt you. But when we come under the authority of Jesus, it's always for our good. It always builds us up. And people who say, there's no authority except me in my life, that's not true. You're under the authority of something. All of us are, right? So this is what it means to be a disciple. Now, the question I want to go deeper into today is this, is as a congregation, what are some of the challenges we might encounter by moving from a membership mentality to a discipleship mentality? And what are some of the opportunities? Now, let me just break down for you briefly. What is the difference between a membership mentality and a discipleship mentality? First, don't, don't misunderstand me. Member and membership are good words. They are good biblical words. The Apostle Paul talks about how being baptized into Christ means that we are a member of the body of Christ. And so that's a good thing. And I believe that it is essential to the discipleship of every Christian to be part of, a, a member of a local church. It is good and essential for our discipleship that every Christian would be under the authority of a pulpit, the authority of a baptismal font, the authority of an altar, the authority of a community of Christians. That is just basic discipleship, that we would be tied to a church as members. And if maybe we're in that in-between place where we're not a member of a church, I say the next step is to become bound to a congregation. This is just a basic part of our discipleship. And while we can say, though, that member and membership are good words, isn't it true that in our society the word member kind of means low stakes, right? Low commitment. Because you can be a member of a gym, you can pay your dues every month and never go, right? Been there, done that, right? You could just make a monthly donation to the YMCA but never use their equipment, right? You could be a member of, say, Sam's Club, but maybe if Costco opens up across town, you can ditch that membership and go over and get a new one. You could be a member of both, right? And once again, you only go when it's convenient. And so oftentimes, as we hear the word member or membership, we're thinking of low commitment, low stakes. To think back to last week, a membership mentality is cultural Christianity, right? A membership mentality is a consumer Christian mindset. Whereas a discipleship mindset means we're asking the fundamental question, how do we as individuals and as a community come more and more under the authority of Jesus in our everyday lives? You see the difference? Now, I believe that we as a community at Holy Cross, we have, in, in very many ways, we have a discipleship mindset. I know that and I feel that as I have conversations with you as the members of Holy Cross week to week. I'm not convinced, though, that our entire membership, our 16, 1,700 members at Holy Cross, I'm not convinced that all of our members have a discipleship mindset, right? And so what we're seeking to do in our getting tuned back to where we need to be as a congregation is to have the whole congregation embrace a discipleship mindset rather than a membership mindset. Now, as I mentioned before, there are going to be challenges and opportunities as we move in that direction. Now, what are some of the challenges? I can think of three. Maybe you can think of more. Maybe we'll find more. But I would say there's three challenges as we move in that direction of discipleship as a congregation. Number one, um, a challenge is that some people in our congregation sadly might say, I didn't sign up for this, right? 
They might look at the, the call to follow Jesus and to come under his authority and to grow as Christians and to be faithful in worship and, and, and to serve as Christ served. They might look at that and say, nah, not really. And maybe they wouldn't be as honest as to say, I don't want to be a disciple. But maybe functionally, that's the way it works out, right? That we kind of vote with our feet, we vote with our time, that we communicate that discipleship is just not a priority, right? Um, now, obviously, there's always a chance for us to repent, right? There's a chance for those who would say, I didn't sign up for this, to, to truly hear the call of Christ and to, and to have their hearts uh, grabbed by Jesus and, and, and to repent and believe the good news and to move out of consumer Christianity, to move out of cultural Christianity and to embrace the call to follow Jesus. That's always a possibility. We pray for that. But as a community, we need to recognize the reality that there may be some, even in our congregation, who'd say, no, I don't think so. I, I kind of want status quo. I'd rather be comfortable. I'm okay with Jesus having part of my life, but I don't want him to have everything. I'm okay with, with maybe a little religion, just a little church, but I don't really want to be that committed. Or, or maybe, you know, I, I kind of just really do want the church to be there for emergencies or special occasions, but, but I don't want to be growing with the congregation. And, and I think that emotionally as a congregation, we just need to be ready for that. We need to recognize that sad reality. And yet when we experience that, we are, as a congregation, we are participating in the sufferings of Christ. Because as you look at the, the Gospels, you see countless times where, where there is a call to follow and people say to Jesus, no. Or for example, I encourage you this afternoon to read John chapter 6. In John chapter 6... Uh, Jesus is teaching, and it gets to a point in Jesus' teaching where people are a little bit uncomfortable and, uh, and offended, quite frankly. And, and Jesus won't back down. He's like, this is my word. And there's people, many disciples, it says in John chapter 6, who no longer follow Jesus. They turn back and no longer followed him. And Jesus asks a pointed question to his disciples. He says, are you going to leave too? And I love what Peter says. Peter says, well, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter's speaking out of desperation. He's like, Jesus, if we don't follow you, we, we don't know where to go, right? And yet there were those who were loosely attached to Jesus. And rather than continue with him in his teaching, they sadly departed from him, right? The second challenge of embracing a discipleship mindset is that we as a congregation, we as individuals might look at ourselves and say, this is above me. This is above my pay grade. This sounds like Christianity 2.0, and I, I, I think that I just want to do Christianity 1.0. And uh, we might, so I, I just, I want to speak into the anxiety that you might be feeling, the, the worry or the fear or the hesitation that you might be feeling about embracing a discipleship mindset. Now, the first thing I want to say is this. There is no such thing as Christianity 1.0 and 2.0. There was a, one of the great errors addressed in the Reformation of the church some 500 years ago is that the church in Rome, the Roman church, was teaching this 1.0, 2.0 Christianity. They were basically teaching, if you want to be a guy kind of like, basic disciple, like just barely made it disciple, you know, you can get married and have kids and have a secular profession, like maybe you're a baker or maybe you are like, you know, a cobbler or a farmer or something. But if you want to really do this Christianity thing, then you got to do Christianity 2.0, which is you, you, you leave everything and you enter a monastery and become a monk or uh, a convent and you become a a nun, and you, you take vows of chastity and poverty, and that's the real way to do it. That's Christianity 2.0, and, and, and you got a better chance of getting to heaven that way. And Luther and the Reformers went back to the scriptures, and they said, as you read the scriptures, this just simply isn't true. Because you as a disciple are called to be a disciple wherever God has placed you. God's called you to be a disciple as a husband or a wife or as a grandparent or as a student 
or as a mother or a father or a grandparent or whatever work you're in, that's the located place that God's called you to be a disciple. Now, there, there may be times where, where maybe some of you might be called to become a missionary and sell your stuff and go to someplace far away. Sure. But more likely than not, that's not going to be most of us, right? The beautiful thing about discipleship is Jesus finds you and calls you where you are and that is where you grow and that is where you follow him. There's no such thing as Christianity 2.0. There's just being a disciple. But we all have different callings. And so to address that fear and that worry, that hesitancy that you have, God has placed you in a calling, many different callings, and those callings are the places where you follow Jesus as a disciple, right? And, and your discipleship may lead you to letting go of things, leaving something behind, maybe even a new profession, right? Who knows? But Jesus calls you where you are. The second thing that I would say to those who would maybe say, man, discipleship, that's above me, is this, is that your discipleship doesn't begin with I can, but it begins with I can't. You don't show up to Jesus as a disciple with a resume and say, you know, Jesus, here I am, look at how good I am, I'm able to follow you. No, you show up with a list of your mistakes and your failures and your brokenness, and Jesus says, I'm going to take that from you, throw it away. And I'm going to walk with you, right? He forgives our past. He's with us in all of our flaws and brokenness. That's what it means to follow Jesus, right? Think of it this way. You ever, you ever been to like a, like a symphony concert where people had to like try out and maybe didn't make the cut and they took the best of the best of the best to do like a, I don't know, like a Beethoven concert or something like that? You ever been to something like that? These are the professionals, right? You ever been to a fifth grade band concert? <laughs> it's a struggle, right? You know, you got these kids who are, they're just trying to figure out how to play the saxophone and they haven't figured it out completely and they're doing that all together. Um, friends, we don't show up to Jesus like we're, we're enlisting for like the symphony. Like we show up to Jesus like fifth gr- grade band concert, right? And he takes us and he begins to teach us and mold us and grow us. And if you read the Gospels, you'll see this is the disciples. They've got lots of flaws and lots of struggles, but Jesus doesn't give up on them. He walks with them and he teaches them. Take a look at our Gospel reading today. The backstory that we heard read in the Gospel reading was that uh, Jesus is preaching in, in Peter's boat. He steps into Peter's boat and he's preaching to the people while Peter is over on the shore cleaning his nets. And I can imagine Peter just being annoyed and frustrated because he was out all night fishing and caught nothing. And so you can imagine how even more annoyed Peter might have been when Jesus said to Peter, go out there and catch fish. And you can just imagine Peter thinking, this carpenter from Nazareth Nazareth knows nothing about fishing because you don't fish in the daytime because the water's too clear in the Sea of Galilee. You're going to scare all the fish away. You fish at night. So you can notice maybe the, the, the frustration and the sarcasm in his voice as he says, at your word, master. Well, sure, let's see what happens. And then as the story goes, uh, Peter catches more fish than he can even pull into the boat. And so look at what Peter says to Jesus. It says, but when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Notice that this is how Peter's call to discipleship starts. It doesn't start with Peter saying, I can. It starts with, I can't. Even depart from me. I'm not worthy of you, Jesus. You're above me. I can't follow you. But notice what Jesus does. Jesus says to him, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. See how Jesus is faithful. He finds Peter in his weakness, his failure, his inability, and he says, don't be afraid, come follow me, right? 
And so if you're hearing this language of discipleship and you're like, oh, I don't know, admit that to the Lord. Bring your inability to Christ because, friends, that's where discipleship begins. And actually, that's where discipleship continues. Because I can't, but God, you can. That leads us to our third challenge. You all know the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector? I always come back to this parable. I end up, I probably quote it in a sermon like three or four times a year, I feel like. But um, So the story basically is that there's these two men who go up to pray uh, at the temple. Jesus tells a parable about two men who approach prayer differently. There's the uh, Pharisee who trusts in his own actions and he looks down on everybody else because he thinks he's like, you know, He's like Pharisee 2.0. He's like above everybody. And then there's this tax collector who can't even look up to heaven, who just says, God, be merciful to me. Let's look at the text. It says, the Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus goes on to say in the story that the, the Pharisee goes home not right with God, not justified. But the tax collector goes home right with God, justified. Now, I believe that this story is a, is a great reminder for us of what it looks like to be a disciple. And see, here's my third challenge. The third challenge we might encounter if we embrace a discipleship mindset. We must be aware of this. Sometimes when Christians encounter very sudden and quick growth, they can sometimes point the finger at others and say, why aren't you growing as quickly as me? Entire churches have been split over this, where you have a faction of people who say, we're the real disciples, and then there's just the rest of you. We're 2.0, and you're 1.0, right? We hear this sometimes in the church where we complain that we got 20% of the people doing 80% of the work, right? And, and so there's a temptation here that, that it, when, when, if the Lord, you know, he awakens people to, to, to deeper discipleship and we, we wake up and we, we realize what it means to follow Jesus and we begin to, de to get deeper into God's word and deeper into prayer, we can begin to use the metrics of our own discipleship that I'm reading the Bible this much, I'm praying this much, I'm attending church and volunteering this much. We can use that to become inflated and prideful and quite frankly, difficult to be around. Um, some of the most annoying people I've met in life are people who grew very quickly as a Christian, but they grew faster than their humility, right? You ever met somebody who's just unbearable to be around? And maybe they call themselves a Christian? Because maybe they're saying, you're not doing it as good as I am, or we're the real Christians, and you're just, you know basic, right, as a Christian. That's a big temptation. The posture that we take as disciples when we grow is that we fall on our knees and we say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Because the more you get to know Jesus, the more you'll realize that you're not like him. The more you walk with Christ, the more you'll realize how flawed you are, but how forgiven you are. See, we as Christians, in our discipleship, we do not, we never graduate from grace. We never outgrow the gospel. Our growth as a disciple means that we are more deeply dependent upon Jesus for everything. Right? It doesn't mean we run out in front of the Lord and say, I'm strong, I'm capable, I'm a Navy SEAL for Jesus. No, no. It means that you recognize your own inability and your dependence upon Jesus. That, that when you see change in your life, when you see yourself spending more time in Scripture, when you see yourself being more faithful in the church, that you fall down on your knees and you say, God, I'm thankful this has got to be you and not me. Right? That's the posture that we take. 
finally, in just the last couple moments here, what, what are the opportunities of embracing a discipleship mindset over a membership mindset? We have to talk about the opportunities because there's going to be points where this is uncomfortable. Growth is always uncomfortable. The status quo is comfortable. Growth is not, but it's good and it's beautiful. What's the big opportunity here? If I could boil down the opportunity of moving to a discipleship mindset, just boil it down plain and simple, this is what I would say. The, the, the opportunity is that we as the church shine more brightly the beauty of Christ. There is nothing more beautiful for, for our, there is nothing more beautiful for our eyes to behold than Christ crucified. And so for the world to see a church that's crucified with Christ, that's laid down its life to live with Jesus, that's an enormously beautiful thing. It's beautiful when the, when the world looks at the church and sees something different. I'll give you just an example of this. I believe that one of the, the, the fundamental skills that we need to learn as disciples in the church is how to practice reconciliation with others. This means that I learn how to apologize and that I learn to hear from another person, I forgive you. In cultural and consumer Christianity, it is just fine for you to want forgiveness from God but not give it to others. In a membership mindset, it is perfectly acceptable for you to have people you just don't talk to or that you just don't like in the church. That's fine. You can do that in a membership mentality, right? But in a discipleship mindset, reconciliation is important. It's a basic skill of being a disciple that as I'm reconciled with God, I practice reconciliation with other people. Now, we're going to actually focus on the theme of reconciliation all of Lent. It's going to be how we spend our Lent. Is What does it look like for me as a disciple to forgive and be forgiven by other Christians? And that's a discipleship mindset, right? Now, what would it look like if people who were not reconciled became reconciled? Can you see how that's beautiful? How the light of Christ shines more brightly. And that's what we mean. This is the opportunity here is that as we embrace a discipleship mindset, as we're growing as disciples, the light of Christ shines even more brightly. And that's a beautiful thing. And so God, may, may God be with us. May he encourage us. May he strengthen us as we come to him, asking him to make us disciples of Jesus all the more. Amen.